And now we move on to the next session where I take immense privilege to begin the lifetime recognition oration that will be delivered by Professor Norman Sartorius. To chair this session, I would like to welcome Professor Srinivasa Murthy to kindly grace the dais. Professor Srinivasa Murthy is a much so it is a much respected teacher and mentor to many of the current leaders in Indian psychiatry. He was the editor-in-chief of the landmark WHO publication World Health Report on Mental Health 2001. He was awarded the Distinguished Scientist Chair of the Indian Council of Medical Research, New Delhi in 2016. His current work involves developing self-care skills for emotional health in special population of persons living with cancer and HIV AIDS. I now request Sir to introduce our speaker, Professor Norman Sartorius, who is connected with us today virtually to deliver his oration. Over to you, Sir. Thank you. Uh, greetings to all of you. Uh, greetings to Sartorius. We'll get you on the screen in a five minutes or so. I consider it a special privilege to be introducing Dr. Sartorius. We just heard Dr. Big and Dr. Verma, two of my gurus, and Dr. Yes. Sartorius is the third guru of my professional life. And I'm glad that he's talking to us about psychiatry of the future years. I'll take a five minutes to introduce the legendariness of Dr. Sartorius, a term used by everyone, not only by us in India, but everywhere, and his long association with this Department of Psychiatry, which goes back to 1973. Dr. Sartorius has a very unusual childhood. He was born in Croatia, lived through the Second World War, and his mother was a famous uh, doctor, and he earned the compassion skills during the Second World War. Did my medical education in Zagreb in 1958. He was the youngest student of his batch. Following that, he did an uh, Institute of Psychiatry, and very interestingly, when he did his uh, PhD, the thesis he did was on cognitive functions in schizophrenia. And he came out with this in the early 60s, the late 60s, the finding that there is cognitive disturbances in schizophrenia. Very well accepted now, but at that time thought to be blasphemous. People said there must be something wrong with what you have done. And that's how progressive he was. Then he joined WHO Department of Mental Health in 1977 uh, and became a head of the Division of Mental Health in 1977 and uh, has done large number of uh, international studies like the International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia, so course and outcome of schizophrenia and number of things. Very importantly, within a few years of becoming a head of the Division of Mental Health, he showed his concern for developing countries by organizing in Adasa Baba a meeting on mental health care in developing countries, of which Dr. Big was one of the participants, followed by an expert committee of WHO on organization of mental health services in 1974. Again, Dr. Big was the reporter of that group and publishing the landmark publication, Organization of Mental Health Services in Developing Countries, which continues to be a very, very important milestone. In uh, 1990s, he started the Open the Door anti-stigma program in 20 countries and has continued. You might ask me, how is he seen by international colleagues besides us? I just want to quote you something which was written in Lancet in 2013 by Simon Weisley. He said, he, Hello? Is, he is a living legend. This was repeated again by Richard Lane in 2019, titled Norman Sartorius, Psychiatrist Legend. And this very unusually, 60 young psychiatrists wrote two, two years, two months later to describe him as their inspiration for the rest of their life. Coming to his association with the department, he came first time in 1973 at the Indian Psychiatric Society Conference. 73, 77, the WHO Collaborating Center, National Mental Health Program in 1982. What? In 1991, when I was the head of the Department uh. of Psychiatry in Nimhans, he gave a substantial amount of personal money to start young mental health okay, professionals fine. workshop. He concludes, Sartorius is indeed a living legend with legendary heritage of people who have been trained by him, who are devoted to his work and believe in the future. I end by saying what one Sartorius told me. 
I refuse to be governed by my birth certificate. If I can make a difference, then I will get engaged, not think of my age. With this is the man that we are going to hear. I feel honored to be able to introduce him. Norman, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me start to, uh, by saying how delighted I am to be here with you virtually and uh, also um, to thank the host for uh, inviting me to be present in today's uh, uh, Dam Jubilee. I remember very vividly the time when Professor uh, Wig and other colleagues have been uh, inviting me to come to the uh, Silver Jubilee uh, of the department. And it was a, a memory uh, that is with me until today, both because of the warmth with which I was received, the excellence of the talks which were given, and the wonderful atmosphere that was created at the time. So today I'm to speak about the mental health workforce for the future, its qualities and tasks. And I think that it's important that we remember that um, there is a variety of tasks that are composing mental health programs and that the, these tasks seem to be equally important. Uh, I'm listing them on this slide here, which I hope you can see. Um, and these are uh, the treatment of mental disorders, the support and uh, uh, care for people who experience mental illness, support to people who provide care, action against stigma, different types, pre primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention of mental disorders, and the promotion of mental health. All of these tasks are written down somehow in the post descriptions of the documents which we have, and uh, they are seeming to be of the same importance. Yet, if you look in the practice, we can see that uh, at present, the areas of work which are currently in the center of attention of the mental health workforce are the treatment of mental disorder far on top uh, with some activity of support and uh, to care who people have the mental illness, which is in addition to treatment, some um, action against stigma and some effort to produce secondary and tertiary prevention of mental disorders. These are somehow in the mind also of the educators who work with young psychiatrists and <clears throat> also in the mind of uh, the government which feels that these are somehow the main tasks that people who have uh, to deal with the mental disorders in a country uh, have to deal with. But I think as time goes by, we will have to re-examine whether these tasks, whether these uh, uh, various areas of activities are really the most important or whether we should perhaps change this a little bit if we want to meet the future uh, with more success. And I think that we will uh, have to think differently. Number one, we should put probably the priority of what we are doing in the future to thinking about how to support the people who provide care for people with mental disorders. Uh, <clears throat> we have, to a large extent, resolved at least some of the problems that concern the treatment which we are providing to people who are mentally ill. But the real task uh, particularly nowadays when uh, the communities have become very weak and uh, because of urbanization uh, do not in many places exist anymore. And when at the same time, we are seeing also that uh, the, we are moving uh, out of any institutions, the real burden of care is falling in increasingly on a very small number of people in the immediate surrounding of the person with a mental illness. It's a tremendous uh, burden which they are carrying. They are carrying it well, but sometimes they give up, sometimes they break down, and sometimes they just go away. And I think that we have to think of ways to strengthen and give some much more attention to, to support to carers, uh, much more than we have ever done before. We should also revive the original ideas about the primary prevention of mental and neurological disorders. Some uh, 50 years ago, many, many years ago, while I was still at uh, the World Health Organization, we have submitted to the uh, World Health Assembly a listing of a variety of mental and neurological disorders which are amenable to primary prevention and uh, which could, in fact, be uh, removed if we uh, move the various governmental efforts in the right direction. And I think that that must become or re-become one of the chief priorities that we are seeing. And the third one is to think about ways of 
promoting mental health. Now, the promotion of mental health has different meanings, but one of its meaning is that we are moving the mental health as a value up on the scale of values so that it becomes more important for people. Because once we achieve that mental health is considered as important, is considered as high on the scale of values, it will be the people who will carry the further progress. They will, in fact, make sure that mental health is given the attention which it deserves. But so you see, to an extent, while we are still having to think about the treatment of mental disorders and support to people who have these disorders, act against stigma, we have to add to our agenda those three very important tasks in a much more, to a much more uh, intensity than we have ever done before. Now, what could we do for carers? First, of course, at present, we have to look what is currently being done. And we have recently done a small survey to see what kind of a support is being given to them. And basically, it's the things which are written on this slide. They get some financial support not always, not everybody, and be difficult very often. Mm -hmm. And when it is given, it is meager. It's not much. Uh, they get lectures, and this is lectures which are usually concentrating on how to deal with an emergency and how to deal with a uh, uh, agitation and how to deal with uh, ag aggression. But it's not regular. Not everybody is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody is involved. People don't have the time. They live far away. They cannot come. Teachers who are doing it, psychiatrists, are very often not so well versed about what should be done because they don't live with mentally ill people. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's done, but to a lesser degree. Uh, we also, some people in particular, others less, uh, have some empathy and some sympathy for these, and uh, we are encouraging people who are carers uh, to do their work. And of course, they get support from those who surround them. This also de depends on where you are. In a majority of urbanized countries, the community as such does not exist. Nobody is supporting them, and the care is entirely a task of the carer uh, without any help from anybody else in the surroundings. So that is not much. And yet we are, as I said, we are expecting that they will carry most of the burden that is uh, uh, to be uh, carried for to make a person with a mental illness survive and uh, get well again. Now, here is some things that we should be adding to them. We should first, before we discharge any patients, we should think and define what are the uh, ways in which we will assess whether a particular carer or future carer has the capacity to look after a person with mental illness. If we are thinking of discharging a person who was in hospital uh, for a short while because he had a confusion or period uh, in the course of dementia, whether we should now discharge that patient into his home where there is perhaps uh, a woman looking after three small children and maybe also a sick husband. She cannot look to another person for another person's care. It's just impossible. And we have to think, what is the minimum that must exist in the family or with friends in order to be able to accept a person with all the problems which this may bring? And that basic assessment of the uh, uh, capacity to care is not done very much. Pro probably some of the more experienced uh, uh, doctors will, in fact, uh, discover situations in which it's totally impossible to uh, uh, provide care. And they will think of other solutions. But in majority of cases, we are happy to discharge the patient, thinking that we have now achieved uh, our goal, while, in fact, uh, we have discharged the person in a situation in which he cannot be given care and will soon return back to, a, the, uh, to in a worse state than it was before. So the first one, we should think in every culture, every place, in every community uh, in which people are working, what is the minimum capacity that has to be present if a person is discharged? We've been looking for papers. The only paper that I ever found about that was a paper written by a person who had schizophrenia and who was writing in a journal that is being issued by uh, a society of uh, people with experience who experience mental illness in Holland. No other documents that they speak of assessing capacity to care of a family or other group of carers. We should also think of how to help these carers, because even if they are today capacity, had the capacity to look after a person, they'll get very tired. 
We have to think of ways in which we can allow them to take a holiday from caring. We are thinking that people who are working in a factory, they deserve three or two or some weeks to every year to be off their work because that will enable them to gather strength, maybe to go to the seaside or basically to relax for a while. Yet for carers, we don't think about that very much. We are not thinking of how to organize ourselves to permit the carers to recover from their tasks. Maybe we should on occasion uh, think of a, creating a facility which will take the patient, although he is not worse in his condition, but where we are going to provide the care so that the carers can have a few days off and can uh, uh, um, be uh, on their own and uh, uh, perhaps uh, take some recreative activities or whatever else they would like to do. So that arrangements which will enable the carers to recover are very important as well. We should also somehow recognize that they are doing something and that their contribution is very valuable. There's only one society that I know in the world, which is uh, every year recognizing a particular family as being a champion, being uh, the best in providing care. And uh, this is the Royal uh, College of Psychiatrists. But there are other ways in which we can recognize the uh, tremendous contribution which carers make in looking after a person year in, year out for many, many years sometimes. And we should recognize it and we should make this recognition public uh, and uh, uh, make it felt by the people. But even a simple recognition uh, of uh, telling the people how much we appreciate what they're doing would sometimes be enough to make them, to give them extra strength. We should also think about giving them uh, the recognition in practical terms uh, for example, by inviting them to come and teach medical students about ways of looking at a person with mental illness at home. They know it. They've been doing it. They're doing it for many years. There's nobody who has more knowledge than they have. So why not in invite them to come and teach? And it will be on one hand will be useful to students because they learn something firsthand, but it will be also useful for them because they will recognize it, they understand that we have recognized that they have the knowledge, that they have the wish, the motivation, and uh, the skills which are necessary. And we should also think about every so often <clears throat> rearranging the uh, or restructuring our strategies concerning carers, asking them what could be done, asking what can, what kind of solutions we could do. But very often the resources are minimal, but they can be used a little bit differently, and they can be extremely good partners in advising us how to do this and how to better use what we have. And what also we would need to ask, we have to think of, um, of thinking of adequate financial support. When a bed is liberated, there is a, so to say, money has been saved and the money should follow the patient. It should follow the patient and the family, which is receiving that patient for care. Very often it is such dire strides, dire strides that they will not be able to do it unless we give them some financial support. Um, maybe also in some places I've seen that they have been uh, allowed to benefit from some food that has been created in the hospital, produced in the hospital and taken to, uh, to, to be um, taken out to be eaten at home. We should think about ways in which we can create, organize, support and uh, promote peer organizations in which people who have experienced mental illness are allowed and invited to help other people who are now in trouble uh, by advice, by being with them, by thinking together with them what could be best done by helping them in concrete ways. And we should uh, think also about how to uh, educate people in a better way, thinking at all times that we have uh, the duty to consider the carers being just as important as we are, if not more important in the process of uh, caring. Of course, there are various legal and administrative changes which can be done as well. These will vary from country to country and from place to place. Shouldn't be forgotten either when we are doing about this. So that I think is one of the very important priorities that sits before us. And we have to learn how to do this, how to best care for carers. Now, the second priority that I would like to promote uh, is the uh, prevention, the primary prevention of mental disorders. 
at present, uh, if you look at the world's mental health program, there are very few which have a specific activity that deals with primary prevention. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, uh, in the past presented documents which listed various of the possibilities. I'll mention some of them. For example, the provision of iodine to pregnant women will prevent the birth of children with cretinism. Not just so few. There are every year the estimates are between four and five million children who are born cretins because their mothers haven't been given iodine uh, or haven't been given an opportunity to get uh, some iodine supplementation during their pregnancy. Uh, another uh, area in which primary prevention could be very helpful is the detection and correction of minor sensory deficits that happen in children. Uh, a child with a somewhat lesser hearing will very often be considered stupid, disobedient, very often will not succeed in school and not uh, uh, infrequently be just dropped and become a street child in the street among three children being exposed to all of the risks that are usually uh, present there from drug taking to crime to um, various other problems that three children do experience. And I think that the screening for uh, uh, sensory deficit is a very relatively easy task. And once recognized, one can probably uh, uh, do much about it. Take, for example, screening for visual deficit, minor visual deficit, when it's myopia, is discovered very quickly because children put the thing to their nose to read. But when it's hypermetropia, when it's, uh, the children are uh, having a uh, no problem in reading things that are far away, but when they took a book before them, they will have difficulties, sometimes being given a diagnosis of dyslexia, sometimes mm -hmm. but being talked to because they don't want to work, sometimes being accused to be lazy, disobedient, not concentrating, and various other things. These children also have problems, and very often they will uh, uh, end up as three children. A pair of glasses now, when produced en masse, is 0 0.6 uh, euros, dollars, uh, whatever. That is about the cost of one half of a bottle of Coca-Cola. And these glasses can be produced and can be offered uh, to uh, people with minor sensory deficits, minor uh, visual deficits such as this. Uh, there is also a variety of specific studies that have been done. The first one, very famous of those, has been the study that Michael Rutter has done many years ago, in which he identified a variety of risk factors. He, at the time, identified six of those, including maternal mental illness, paternal criminality, frequent hospitalization, etc. And these risk factors are interchangeable. It does not matter which one you remove. Whenever you remove one, the probability of mental illness will drop. And one of the other of them are in our hands. We can think of ways in correcting some of the risk factors of children and preventing the occurrence of an illness. Um, the fact that risk factors are additive in nature is very often disregarded. And we think that we have to deal with all of these factors to achieve something. No matter which of the factors we remove, uh, which of the uh, causes of uh, uh, contributing causes is removed, it will sink the overall incidence of mental disorders. Uh, there is also, uh, unfortunately, a huge number of children who are exposed to stunting because of a um, lack of food, lack of money, poverty, various other reasons. Many of them uh, could, in fact, be significantly helped in their growth by stimulation programs. And in many uh, developing countries, I shouldn't say developing countries, low and middle income countries nowadays, there are, in fact, useful programs, and we should give a chance to people who do this program to speak about it, inspire others, and be teachers of other people who would like to see their children grow well, despite of poverty. Now, we should also think uh, uh, furthermore of uh, other opportunities which exist, not only to prevent mental illness in the child, but also to prevent problems that exist uh, in the, uh, and can be corrected. One wonderful area for the primary prevention of mental disorders is participation of mental health specialists in the structuring of perinatal care, involving fathers as well as mothers uh, in ways in which uh, children should be brought up. 
And I think that that is something where we could. Perinatal care is now being established in many places, but the majority of those places, perinatal care includes no components of mental illness, mental health, or any other uh, subject that we would uh, want to um, would address. Another area of is educating parents. Mm -hmm. Now, here I have to tell you a personal story. I have a niece, and uh, our niece couldn't have children, so they decided they would adopt a child. And uh, in order to be adopted, adopt a child, in, uh, they have the uh, future adoptive parents have to go to a course for six months. And during these six months, they learn various things. Then they pass an exam, and then they can reapply to finally to finalize the process of adoption. And I ask you, how many normal mothers, which can have children, are in fact given six months training on how to be a parent before they become parent? Six months is maybe too much. Maybe three months would be fine. Maybe a month would be very useful. Maybe a few weeks or days uh, of educating the parents about their tasks, their ways of behavior, their way of treating the child would be things that we could do and without too much expense or problem. We should, of course, also think of uh, collaborating with school authorities when they are doing their education. There are numerous things that we know could be done, which do not cost extra money, but which concern the organization of the day of the child in school and so forth. And uh, it's common knowledge now, not in psychiatry, it's common knowledge in the educational sector, which very often misuses them. Now, uh, I think that the families which are at risk of mental disorders for a variety of reasons should also be given a little more attention than are given at present. All of these things that I mentioned are possibilities for primary prevention of mental disorders. And none of them, unfortunately, is given sufficient attention at present, neither by the authorities, which you can understand, nor by psychiatrists and people who lead the programs, uh, which is more difficult to understand. Now, a third of the great priorities that I mentioned in the past is the promotion of mental illness. The promotion of, oh, pardon, sorry, promotion of mental health and the fight against mental illness. And the promotion of mental health can mean one of three things. Either we can talk about the promotion by when we are reducing the number of people with mental illness in a population, or if we do things that uh, reflect, uh, you know, that, that increase the resilience or better achievement, uh, or if we manage to heighten mental health on the scale of values of individuals and societies. We should think about all three of them, but undoubtedly the question of heightening mental illness, mental illness uh, prevention and uh, promotion of mental health uh, is by uh, tampering with the values uh, which mental health is given is the most important one. It does do something because once people believe that their mental health is valuable and important, they will do things themselves to promote it and protect it. Now, in order to be prepared for the new world in which these new tasks that I mentioned, as well as the tasks which are there anyway, like treatment of mental illness and so forth, uh, will be done, we have to think of how to prepare uh, our uh, the mental health workforce uh, and the society for these various activities. We should be very careful and think of ways in which we can revise the selection of people who will become future doctors. I think that that is very important. Being a future, being a doctor does not only mean uh, having good notes and passing exams. It requires a personality. It requires a, a, a way of living. It, it requires many things. And uh, I think a, a careful selection of people who will become doctors is a very important thing, not only for them, because they will, if they become doctors and are not made for it, will have an unhappy life, but also because we need people who have uh, a personality structure, who have empathy, who understand and worry about other people, etc. We need to have those people entering into our workforce. We have also to think of revising the undergraduate as well as postgraduate education. Because there are many things that we are not doing. I mentioned some of those things which are given relatively little attention in the course of the medical curriculum. But there are many things that we have to think about if we want really to make 
uh, young doctors uh, become helpful and being useful not only for mental health but also for uh, the promotion of medicine as a whole. We should be very careful to select uh, mental health laws or laws which are touching mental uh, health and mental illness. These laws are very often obsolete and some of them have been fine at the time that they uh, were uh, enacted, but as time went by became obsolete. And I think that it's very important to think that when a new mental health law is put into operation, it should have a sunset clause. It should say this law is valid for three years. In three years time, we have to re-examine the rules which we have put down. Because we don't do this, we see that laws become obsolete in the uh, very and, and disturbing in many ways. I'm always struck by the example of a survey that was done in Spain in which um, the, uh, having examined what happens, we found that there is a, a prohibition that patients in the mental hospitals in Spain are not allowed to eat cheese. Now this is a, was a perfectly reasonable pro prohibition at the time when uh, the uh, MAO inhibitors were used for the treatment of depression. And uh, at that time, having uh, cheese as well as the MAO inhibitors wasn't such a good idea. But the MAO inhibitors have vanished from the surface altogether. They are not used anymore, anywhere. And now cheese prohibition is still there because nobody went through the rules and regulation at a regular pace, seeing which of them are still valid, which of them are still necessary, which of them can be changed. We should also think about uh, educate education about mental health in the framework of health education in general. I'm giving an example of problem solving, for example, which is a skill that can be learned relatively quickly, which could be introduced in primary schools, could be introduced at other levels as well. And many of the problems which gradually accumulate until they get so heavy that they create a problem of worthy of treatment could have been prevented by a relatively short lasting education about problem solving early in one's career, early in one's schooling. We should also think somehow uh, um, bringing it clear into the schools and everywhere how terribly important it is to learn, to teach people, to make it part of them that they should accept people who are different, whether they are different in race, in color of skin, in mental health, or in any other aspect, they should be accepted by others. The notion of being tolerant and being accepting of people regardless of their differences is terribly important and should be given a significant attention during primary school, in health education at home, but also in human ethical education that parents uh, and others who are responsible for education will give to their children. Now, uh, as I said, uh, already we will try to, we should try to make sure that the health workers in general will, uh, should not be only selected because they are bright and have excellent notes, but also because they have a personality that is suitable. And personality that is suitable includes some of the things that are listed here, a capacity for empathy, a strong sense of justice, a respect for other people. All of these things should be included because if we include them, we will get better doctors and we'll have less unhappy doctors because people who do not have these characteristics very often find that doctoring is not such a great uh, uh, profession and will probably be unhappy in their job and also do a poor job. We will also have to think, of course, of uh, making our places in which we are training people more attractive and better. Any error that is existing in a, in a system which trains is reflected thousandfold in all the students who pass through the training. So that the attention to uh, details of the way in which uh, uh, training is provided, way in which care is given, is tremendously important in institutions which are providing care and also uh, train people for the future. Now, psychiatrists for the future, well, of course, not only do they have to train in the ways that I mentioned just before, but they have to have other things as well. Number one, they have to be expert users and teachers of communication skills. 
They have to learn how to speak. They have to learn how to listen. They have to learn how to be attentive. Many of the communication skills which they should have, they don't. And I think it's not because they are stupid or in, incompetent. It's because there's nobody paid attention during their entire schooling to uh, develop the communi communication skills and other social skills, which are very important. They, of course, have to continue to be competent in the care of people with uh, uh, mental illness, but they also have to have a capacity to deal with comorbid mental and physical illness. In other words, they cannot just close their eyes or not want to listen mm -hmm. about the physical problems that people with mental illness have. Mm -hmm. They should be able to provide, they are doctors after all, and being doctors, they have to also recognize the physical illness, maybe occasionally asking for advice from somebody else to deal with this or, or arranging things so that people can get advice from somebody who is a specialist, but very often just providing also treatment for the physical illness, which is so frequently present. We have done recently a, a survey to see how many people in the, uh, who are specialists in diabetes recognize depression in their patients. An extremely small proportion did so. And even those who did it never wrote it down in their case notes. But the same is unfortunately true for psychiatrists who are very not even aware that the person whom they are treating for depression has a diabetes, which very often uh, is in fact accompanying or perhaps even partially causing the depression which they are treating. So a competency in medicine in general is very important for psychiatrists as well. Uh, they should also be uh, thinking of uh, creating life of which is acceptable for people whom they have treated by advice, by intervention, by thinking of better provisions in the law or elsewhere, which will sometimes require political engagement. But they should try to see to what an extent they can help, not only the, to get the patient better, to treat him, but also to make his life subsequently acceptable and uh, protective of fewer, further uh, episodes of it of illness. Now, one difficult thing which they have uh, is that psychiatrists are very often not very willing to listen to what their patients tell them about care in general. They are listening to their problems, but when the patient would like to advise something about the ways in which services could be organized or anything else, they are not very often willing to listen. And yet, it would be a incomparably easier to provide services which are uh, uh, acceptable uh, if we were to listen to people with mental illness and about ways in which they would like to see the services provided, in which they would help us to think of a service that is uh, acceptable both to the medicine as well as to the people who are suffering. Of course, I mentioned several times, but I'll repeat it again. The empathy for people whom they are treating and for their families is essential for a psychiatrist of its worth. Uh, and I think it has it's very often not possible to uh, uh, implant empathy. And uh, therefore, the selection of people who will be in this job is all the more important. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that it is quite clear that the world of tomorrow will bring many changes. Uh, there will be changes in industry, the changes in way of living, in urban living, many other changes. And I think many of these changes we can foresee now. And we can probably uh, do something at this point, not only uh, for the people with mental illness, but also to improve society as a whole. And I think that many of the measures that I mentioned here do not require major changes. They would require a change in our attitude, in our way of thinking, rather than uh, in any other major uh, revolutionary change. So the responsibility is on our shoulders because we are not only giving help to people now, we are also teaching future generations which come before us, uh, after us, and as much as we have learned for people who were before us and who taught us many useful things. I hope that uh, I shall have the opportunity to talk more with many of you about the problems that I uh, mentioned here and about the ways to solving them, learn from you, and I hope also uh, encounter uh, you in person. Unfortunately, I'm not with you today, uh, but uh, I'm with you in my spirit and my thoughts and hope and wish you all the very best 
for your work now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Norman, if you can just hold on, we have still eight minutes of our time to, till 12.30. I just want to say it was a brilliant coverage of the task for the future. For those of you who are hungry to get to the bottom of it, luckily this morning when I opened the email, there was the latest issue of the World Psychiatry, October 2023. There is an article by Dr. Sartorius titled, Community Care for People with Mental Illness, Challenges Emerging in the 2020s and Consequent Recommendations. It's a two-page article, worth reading it. You can download it, it's an open access one. And as I say, Norman Sartoris is like Akshay Patra. He keeps giving and giving and uh, this lecture is a good illustration of that uh, giving attitude, thinking of the future and stimulating us to aim for higher. With these words, I would like to request the organizer to present a certificate, e-certificate to Dr. Sartorius to recognize his contribution and pray our pranams, our greetings and our respects to Norman Sartorius. Uh,